Welcome to the 2020 Richard B. Lippin Lecture in Ethics, brought to you by the Rock Ethics Institute from our home in Penn State's College of the Liberal Arts. My name is Ted Toadvine. I'm the director of the Rock Ethics Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this year's Lippin Lecture. Tonight, we are privileged to be joined by Mr. Dick Lippin, a 1968 psychology graduate and founder of the Lippin Group. Dick has spent more than 30 years serving as a close advisor to some of the world's most prestigious entertainment and media companies and associations in the United States and around the globe. He is very proud, as well he should be, of the fact that many of his clients and company executives have been with the Lippin Group for more than a decade and that he has built a business known for its integrity, loyalty, and success. Dick's support in creating this lecture has made tonight's event with Virginia Eubanks possible. Dick felt that much of the integrity and honesty that he knew growing up now seems lacking in the world of business. With his late wife, Ronnie, he wanted to provide an opportunity for learning around current ethical issues in the fields of business, medicine, science, and technology, as well as questions of justice. Thank you, Dick. I would also like to thank our co-sponsors for this evening's lecture, the Center for Humanities and Information, the Donald P. Belisario College of Communications, the McCourtney Institute for Democracy, and University Libraries. And now I will turn the program over to Daniel Susser. Daniel is Assistant Professor of Information Sciences and Technology and Philosophy and a Research Associate in the Rock Ethics Institute. And he will be introducing this evening's speakers. Daniel? Thanks, Ted. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Virginia Eubanks, Associate Professor of Political Science at the University at Albany, SUNY. She's the author of Automating Inequality, How High-Tech Tools Profile, Police, and Punish the Poor, and Digital Dead End, Fighting for Social Justice in the Information Age. She's co-editor with Alethea Jones of Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around, 40 Years of Movement Building with Barbara Smith. Her writing about technology and social justice has appeared in Scientific American, The Nation, Harper's, and Wired. For two decades, Eubanks has worked in community technology and economic justice movements. She was a founding member of the Our Data Bodies Project and a 2016-2017 fellow at New America. Um, as someone who works on the social and ethical dimensions of algorithmic systems, I can say that Dr. Eubanks' work is some of the richest, most illuminating work I read and teach. Um, rather than centering technology and its creators, Dr. Eubanks explores the people whose lives are impacted by automated decision-making systems and the social and political contexts they are embedded in and refigure. We are incredibly lucky to have her with us today. Uh, I look forward to both her talk and the discussion that follows. Dr. Eubanks, over to you. Thank you so much. What an incredible introduction. Um, I just want to start by thanking everyone who's in the audience for being here tonight. I know you have lots of things pulling on your attention. Uh, I also know that uh, long Zoom meetings are things that um, bring special challenges. Um, and so your choice to spend your time and attention with us this evening um, I'm, I think is incredibly generous and I'm really, really grateful for it. Um, I also wanna say thank you to everybody at Penn State and Rock Ethics Institute, but especially Ben and Eduardo and Ted and Daniel and David and Betsy Marie and Tony. And of course my incredible, incredible company on the panel coming up, Sarah and Pamela. Um, I find floating Zoom heads very hard to concentrate on. Um, and so I'm gonna keep the sort of lecture part of my uh, comments this evening fairly brief. And we'll try to move quickly to conversation and audience questions um, and all the fun interactive stuff. Um, also, I find conversations about technology and ethics, they tend to be pretty abstract. So I love how Daniel introduced me in part because what I think is special about the opportunity I had to write Automating Inequality was the incredible 100 plus people I spoke to when I was reporting the book. And so what I'd like to do tonight is tell you stories about technology and public assistance um, and governance, but to tell them from the point of view of the people I interviewed during my reporting for the book. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and show you some, some fun slides. Uh, if it doesn't work for folks, please just 
somebody let me know and I can always turn them off. Um, so I want to start by talking about Sophie and Kim Stipes. So I dedicate automating inequality to a severely disabled little girl named Sophie Stipes. And when Sophie was six, she received a letter that explained that she'd be losing her Medicaid because she had failed to cooperate in establishing eligibility for the program. And this happened just as she was beginning to gain weight thanks to a life-saving feeding tube and learning to walk for the first time in her short life. So the Stipes family was caught up in an attempt to automate the eligibility process for all of the welfare programs in the state of Indiana. In 2006, then Governor Mitch Daniels signed what was eventually a $1.34 billion, that's billion with a B, billion dollar contract with a consortium of high tech companies that included IBM and ACS or affiliated computer systems to create a system that replaced the hands on work of local welfare caseworkers with online applications and private regional call centers. And the result was a million benefits denials in the first three years of the experiment mostly for this sort of catch-all uh, reason, failure to cooperate in establishing eligibility. And that just meant that someone somewhere in the process had made a mistake. It could have been the applicant, they could have forgotten to sign a form, for example, or a call center worker might have made a mistake in applying policy, or the computer system itself could have made an error, not recognizing pay checks as proof of income, for example, because it was only programmed to recognize pay stubs. But the failure to cooperate notices only said there was an error, not what it was. And because it severed the relationship between applicants and local caseworkers, the system virtually guaranteed that the burden of finding and fixing that mistake fell squarely and solely on the shoulders of those people who were requesting services, which were some of the state's most vulnerable families. And this created enormous hardship for families like the Stipeses. Um, Kim Stipes, uh, Sophie's mother, told me, for example, during that time, my mind was muddled because it was so stressful. All my focus was getting Sophie back on that Medicaid and then crying afterwards because everyone was calling us white trash and moochers. It was like being sucked up into this vacuum of nothingness. Okay, second family. So I talked in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, which is the county where Pittsburgh is, to Angel Shepherd and Patrick Grebe. Um, they're really engaged, really creative parents, um, but nevertheless, they've been red flagged several times for child neglect by the county's um, Office of Children, Youth, and Family Services. And Patrick and Angel's primary crime is that they're poor. Patrick was found guilty of child neglect, for example, when he couldn't afford his daughter's antibiotic prescription after an emergency room visit. And they live in a kind of constant low-grade terror that a new statistical tool that is being uh, tested by the county, it's called the Allegheny Family Screening Tool, or the AFST, will target their daughter or their granddaughter for a child welfare investigation and potentially for removal to foster care. So that model, the Allegheny Family Screening Tool, is a predictive um, algorithm that is supposed to um, be able to predict which children might be victims of abuse or neglect sometime in the future. And the model's built on top of a data warehouse that at the time of the writing of Automating Inequality held 1 billion records, which was more than 800 for every resident of the county. Um, so data extracts are regularly collected from adult and juvenile probation, the jails and prisons, county mental health services, the state office of income maintenance, the public schools, other agencies that primarily serve poor and working families. Um, so this, of course, limits um, what the model is able to predict, the, the sort of shape of that data set. It relies almost entirely on information that's only collected on families who reach out for help to public assistance programs or other county programs. So professional middle-class families who um, need help, uh, who are likely, in fact, to require and request equal amounts of support, don't end up in this database because they're likely to pay for it through private insurance or out-of-pocket 
so the, their data never goes to the county, so it doesn't end up in the data warehouse, so it doesn't end up in the predictive model. Uh, that many of the families I spoke to in Allegheny County told me it felt like the model was confusing poor parenting with parenting while poor. So the model's designers and administrators at Children, Youth, and Families say that the part of the purpose of the system is actually to root out bias in intake call screener decision making. And these are the folks who pick up, they have a very hard job, they pick up um, the call, if you call an abuse or neglect hotline, they receive reports from mandated reporters all over the county, and it's their job to decide which cases they should refer for a full child welfare investigation. But the thing is, these models don't actually remove bias, they simply move it. So in Allegheny County, the model moves discretion from these frontline caseworkers, these call screeners, who are the most working class, the most female, the most diverse part of the uh, child, youth, and families workforce, and then moves it instead to the economists and the data scientists who build the models. Because part of the problem with these kinds of predictive algorithms is that the system's designers really only see bias as a property of individuals people who they think might hold implicitly or explicitly discriminatory beliefs about families based on race, class, or other factors. But of course, inequity is systemic and structural. And in fact, the county's own research shows that the great majority of racial disproportion in that system comes not from intake screeners, but from the community itself which reports black and biracial families for maltreatment three and a half times more often than they report white families. So by limiting intake workers discretion, the system may actually limit their ability to correct for this overreporting, And in, in the end, it may end up worsening inequality. Now, I think it's really important to acknowledge that human bias has been a deep, deep issue in child protective services since its inception as the sort of orphan trains of um, Charles Brace Loring. Um, but when I asked parents who had been involved with the Children, Youth, and Family Services system in the past, most of whom had very complicated relationships with human child welfare um, case examiners, I asked them whether they'd want a perfectly neutral computer or a, a, a fallible human being making decisions about their family's welfare. And every single one of them said the same thing, that they'd want the human. So Pamela Simmons told me, you can teach people how you wanna be treated. They come with their own opinions, but sometimes you can change those opinions. There's an opportunity to fix it with the person. You can't fix that number. And Janine said to me, a computer is only what a person puts in it. I trust the caseworker more because you can talk and be like, you don't see the bigger problems. So the combination of human and digital surveillance on families like Patrick and Angel's um, leaves parents feeling ambushed and helpless. So Angel told me, you feel like a prisoner. You feel trapped. It's like no matter what you do, it isn't good enough for them. My daughter's now nine. And I'm still afraid that they're going to come back one day, see her outside by herself, pick her up and say, you can't have her anymore. Okay, the last case that I study or that I reported on for automating inequality was a case of the coordinated entry system in Los Angeles. Um, and it responds to the county's really unbelievably tragic housing crisis. So at the time of the book's writing, there were roughly 58,000 unhoused people in LA County. Um, more recently, the 2020 Greater LA Homeless Count documented a 15% increase in the last three years to 66,436 people. And something like 75% of those people are completely unsheltered, living in sidewalk encampments or cars. So this system coordinated entry works by assigning each unhoused person a score um, on a scale of vulnerability. And so coordinated entry actually serves those at the top pretty well. Those folks who face the worst consequences of homelessness, death, emergency room visits, mental health crises, community violence. The system ironically also serves those who are least vulnerable pretty well. 
um, who we could think of as the crisis homeless, who just need a very small investment to recover from something like an eviction, a foreclosure, a job loss, or domestic violence. Um, and unhoused people's vulnerability in this system is established through a very um, extensive, quite intrusive survey with a very terrible acronym. It's called the VI SPDAT or the Vulnerability Index and Service Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool. And it asks questions like, do you ever do things that might be considered risky, like exchange sex for drugs or money, run drugs for someone, have unprotected sex with someone you don't know, share needles, anything like that? And it asks, have you threatened to or tried to harm yourself or anyone else in the past year? Now, some people like Monique Talley, who I spoke with, called coordinated entry a gift from God because it succeeds in getting a small number of people into appropriate housing, particularly, um, potentially more quickly um, than the county has been able to in, in the past. Um, at the time of the book's publication, coordinated entry had matched 9,627 people with some kind of housing resource. But at the same time, there were 20,000 people that the system had surveyed, classified, and vulnerability ranked who never received any resources at all. People like Gary Boatwright, um, who I spoke to and saw himself as strong enough to survive um, houselessness, but not able to get back on his feet by himself. So Gary has cycled between uh, bouts of homelessness and prison uh, for about a decade at the time that I spoke to him in 2016 and 2017. And from Gary's point of view, his problem wasn't his comparative vulnerability um, compared to his neighbors in the Skid Row neighborhood of downtown Los Angeles. It's simple math. There's just not enough housing in Los Angeles for the county's 66,000 unhoused people. So Gary told me, people like me who are somewhat higher functioning, we're not getting housing. It's another way of kicking the can down the road. In order to house the homeless, he said, you have to have the available units. Show me the units, otherwise you're just lying. Now Gary was arrested just before the book came out and was released in 2017 into a halfway house. And the last time I saw him over lunch at the Nickel Cafe in downtown LA, he was hoping that his parole officer would let him move out of the county so he'd have more housing options. He knew that his time in the halfway house was limited and that he'd have to start all over if he became homeless again. He'd have to get a new tent, he'd have to collect his possessions and the paperwork he had left, he'd have to rebuild a social network to keep himself safe. And if he chooses to take the VI SPDAT survey again to try to get into the coordinated entry system, he will likely score lower on its scale because the model counts being imprisoned as being housed, meaning he'll stay trapped, too vigorous for intervention and too marginal to make a go of it without support. I'm a criminal, Gary told me, just for existing on the face of the earth. So my greatest fear about some of these tools is that they act as a kind of empathy override, allowing us to um, see the decisions we're making as inevitable triage decisions because we have too limited resources to, to um, serve everyone and to make moral judgments about who deserves to be served first. But one of the arguments I try to make in the book is that the idea of digital triage, the idea that we have to do digital triage, is itself a political decision. Triage is really uh, only appropriate if uh, the crisis is short term and if there are more resources forthcoming. If the crisis is chronic, like homelessness in the United States or the housing crisis in the United States, and there are no more resources coming, then what we're doing is not digital triage, it's digital rationing. And we can do better than that. We deserve better than that. I wrote the book because I believe we all deserve better. Our, our people deserve better, our communities deserve better. I think the fundamental danger of what I call in the book the digital poorhouse is that it demands we think small, that we work within sort of arbitrarily imposed limits, both 
to our resources and to our vision. But this political moment, and I think justice itself, demands that we think big, demands that we push back against austerity fever, this idea that there's not enough for everyone. It is simply empirically untrue, and it is a political choice to believe that. So what do we do? I think there are sort of three ways or three major things we need to address immediately to make real change in economic inequity and the digital tools that help us manage it possible. The first thing we need to do is really change the narrative around poverty in the United States. We have this story in the United States that say that poverty is an aberration, but it's simply not true. If you look at political scientist Mark Rank's extraordinary life cycle research, he makes it incredibly clear that between the ages of 20 and 64, 51% of us will be below the poverty line at some point in that period of time in our lives. And a full two thirds of us will receive means-tested public assistance. That means straight welfare. That means cash assistance. That means Medicaid. That means food stamps or SNAP, um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, poverty is a majority experience in the United States. That doesn't mean we're all equally vulnerable. If you're born poor, if you're a person of color, a migrant, a single parent, a woman, a person with chronic illness, mental health issues, or physical limitations, well, then you're more likely to be poor and it's harder to climb out of it once you dip below the poverty line. But the good news is that you have a lot of company. People who experience poverty are not a tiny population of probably pathological people. It's all of us. So if we understand that poverty is a majority experience in the United States, then all of these means-tested, punitive public programs that spend so much of their effort and resources deciding who deserves help, they, they suddenly seem quite ridiculous. Um, we can shift instead to an approach that's based on universal human rights. So we can decide as a country that there is a line below which no one is allowed to go for any reason. We can decide today, no one in the United States goes hungry. We can decide today, no one in the United States lives in a tent on the sidewalk. We can decide today that no family in the United States is split up because parents can't afford a child's medication. In other places around the world, these conditions are quickly recognized as what they are, human rights violations. Here, we're increasingly thinking of them as systems engineering problems. And that should give us deep pause about the state of our national soul, about who we are as people, and about our commitment to ending economic and social inequities. And finally, while we do this really important cultural and political work of changing the narrative and shifting our policies, in the meantime, we have to build technologies that do less harm. And in order to do that, we have to build technologies with our values in mind from the beginning every time. That means we stop designing technology in neutral. Designing objective systems in the world that we live in means designing for the status quo. So we have to design for the world we actually live in, which is a world that's built on a landscape of deep and lasting inequity. So I usually use the metaphor here of designing a car without gears. Um, in a landscape of inequality that is full of twists and turns and hills and valleys, I picture it like San Francisco. So you wouldn't put a car with no gears on the top of Telegraph Hill and just hope for the best that it's going to make it through the um, incredibly uneven landscape of San Francisco. We need to build equity gears into our digital decision-making tools instead of trying to build them in neutral and then being surprised when they crash. This means designing new technologies with all of our values in mind. Efficiency and cost savings are important, of course, but they have to be balanced with our other collective goals, self-determination, dignity, fairness, due process, and equity. If we're to build a more just future, 
we have to build it on purpose, brick by brick and bite by bite. If we outsource our moral responsibility to care for each other to computers, we have no one but ourselves to blame when these systems supercharge discrimination and automate austerity. I really appreciate your time and your attention. Um, and I'm eager for this conversation um, and, uh, and the questions from the audience as well. Thanks so much for that fantastic talk, Virginia. Um, before I introduce our respondents, I wanna let everyone know that you can submit questions for the discussion using the Q&A function in the webinar. So if you go to the Zoom Q&A button um, and enter your questions at any time, and after we hear from our panelists, we will go to audience questions. So please do that um, whenever you're ready with one. Um, so our first respondent is Pamela Van Heitzma who is a Sherwin Early Career Professor in the Rock Ethics Institute. She's the Interim Director of the Center for Humanities and Information and an Assistant Professor in Communications, Arts and Sciences and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. Her book, Queering Romantic Engagement in the Postal Age, A Rhetorical Education, was published by the University of South Carolina Press in 2019. Our second respondent is going to be Sarah Reitmeyer, assistant professor in the College of Information Sciences and Technology and a research associate in the Rock Ethics Institute. Prior to joining the Penn State faculty, Sarah served as a consultant to the government on initiatives on big data and computational social science. Her research is focused in the areas of privacy, data science, and machine learning. Pamela. Thanks, Daniel. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Eubanks, for being with us tonight and sharing your work with us. As Daniel mentioned, I am the interim director of Penn State Center for Humanities and Information, or CHI for short. One of the several co-sponsors for tonight's event, the CHI is a research center that supports humanities-based approaches to investigating the role that information has played in the production of social meaning, from the orality literacy transition to the new digital media. Dr. Virginia Eubanks's book, Automating Inequality, How High-Tech Tools Profile, Police, and Punish the Poor, demonstrates this important role of information in social life. What I want to underscore in my brief response to her work are three of the ways that it exemplifies the best of what becomes possible when approaches adjacent to the humanities are brought to the table in conversations about information technologies. First and foremost, automating inequality share, shows us the power of storytelling as a method for demonstrating the very human impact of technologies that automate basic social functions. In Virginia's own words, the best cure for the misuse of big data is telling better stories. Along these lines, one set of questions I want to offer for a later discussion, Virginia, concerns how you went about fashioning better stories when writing this book. I imagine you're asked this a lot, but why have you turned to storytelling or reporting, uh, if you prefer, as opposed to other research methods that you may have been trained in as an academic in order to show the impact of automation on poor people? And in selecting which stories to share in the book, are there other stories that were not included, but that continue to stick with you as you talk with audiences on occasions like this? Second, automating inequality contextualizes what Virginia calls the digital poorhouse within a longer history that predates the high tech tools under critical examination. Whereas the digitality of the poorhouse may be new, the poorhouse itself is not. According to Virginia, and here I quote her at length, the myopic focus on what's new leads us to miss the important ways that digital tools are embedded in old systems of power and privilege. While the automated eligibility system in Indiana, the coordinated entry system in Los Angeles, and the predictive risk model in Allegheny County may be cutting edge, they are also part of a deep-rooted and disturbing history, end quote. If we want to address poverty, we need to recognize the long histories of intersecting class and racial inequalities that have shaped this country. And new technologies alone are not going to save us or serve as a quick fix. Another question I have for Virginia then is how and why is this historical view necessary 
to not just understanding but improving our present uses of technology, most especially when it comes to questions of social justice. Third and finally, automating inequality helps those of us who may not be experts in the more technical workings of automation to understand how social categories get embedded in so supposedly neutral information processes through proxies. The chapter on Allegheny County's algorithmic risk prediction, for instance, explains how the model, instead of directly measuring harm to children, works with related variables called proxies as stand-ins for child maltreatment. As Virginia mentioned earlier, one of these proxies is community referral, but poor families are those most likely to be referred to public services, whereas middle class families are able to access and afford those kinds of services privately. Moreover, because of systemic racism and racial profiling, black and biracial families are more likely to be referred to childhood protective services. The proxies for risk to children are actually not linked to child mistreatment but to social categories of class and race, and these proxies are built into the model. While most such examples in the book rightly concern categories at the intersection of race and class, the last question I'll pose to Virginia is about normative categories for sexuality. In the book's introduction, you share your own story of getting red flagged by a health insurance system, possibly due to being in a domestic partnership rather than married, and you mentioned elsewhere that poor people are policed based partly on non-normative sexualities and domestic arrangements. And I'm actually just thinking in the moment to uh, gender, um, thinking of you know, transgender women in particular and, and the ways that they get targeted. I'll conclude my response by asking if you could tell us more about that. How, in other words, might normative categories of sexuality as well as gender function as proxies within automated inequality. Thank you. And we will now hear from Sarah, who will also respond to Virginia's work. Thank you, Virginia, for taking time to speak with us and for sharing your insights. Um, in the next couple of minutes, I would like to touch on a few points more specifically related to the technologies themselves. And so looking forward uh, and looking forward from the moment that we're in uh, to possible solutions. Um, the historical context you've shared illustrates the ways that today's tools are deeply embedded. Uh, and this is such a counterpoint to so much of the conversation about big data and AI as so fundamentally disruptive. But in fact, we can't disentangle the role of the tech itself from the social context in which it has been developed. And you've made that argument so beautifully. So I don't want to lose that frame, but I do want to highlight some of the differences you raise between the high tech tools and the institutions that preceded them, because the tools themselves are developing so rapidly now that I think it's worth considering what it is about them that we should be alerted to uh, moving forward. Today's high tech tools are massively scalable. They're hard to understand. The data they, can, they collect can be far reaching and endure for a, a very long time. Decisions and predictions about me are made not only based on my actions, but are impacted by my peers in the widest sense of that word. All of those differences, the fundamental features of big data technologies, scale, complexity, dependency, are simultaneously cause for concern, and also the reason they work as well as they do in so many contexts. And I think for that reason, and for the shiny and exciting promises of big data, we have not fully contended with their implications. And your, your work is really evidence of that, I think. You point to some specific shifts that have resulted from new technologies um, in your book and in your talk today um, that I think uh, we should see as a herald for other areas leaning more and more on data-driven tech as well. Algorithmic tools uh, you, you discuss have shifted human discretionary processes from the front line to the engineer and in doing so have really obscured the values they reinforce, rendering them invisible or far less accessible than they were. And consequently, you discuss this empathy override. So a caseworker can have empathy, whereas technology um, 
act as empathy overrides. And I think maybe this was the eeriest message of your book for me, especially looking five to 10 years down the road and imagining the ways that the technology will, will be authorities, perhaps, in many aspects of daily life. So a series of questions that I'd like to ask you along those lines, you suggest that we're offloading our moral responsibilities onto technology. How do we avoid that without rejecting database systems entirely? How do we stay close to human beings represented as data points? Should there always be an element of human discretion in these systems? And if so, where does it belong? And in the same direction toward sort of what we should be doing, I want to highlight in uh, your what I saw as your main message for, for folks in tech, uh, that tools designed to be neutral when deployed within a landscape of deep inequality only serve to amplify existing inequalities. And one of the reasons I, I really want to highlight that is because in parallel, the technical community is having its own conversation around what they call algorithmic fairness. And I, I know you know about that. And there's an emerging technical literature studying things like how do we mathematically define fairness? Um, and how can we prove an algorithm is fair according to our mathematical definitions? And then other threads of that work, sort of how do we manage biased training data? How do we um, explain these complex systems? But what really struck me after reading your book is that all of the strands of this work, this technical conversation about algorithmic fairness are really focused on neutrality as the highest aim. So we're tinkering at the margins with existing algorithms and models rather than really working to shift the paradigm. And you suggest that the real change won't derive from technology, but from this change in our vision and in our conversation. And I, and I understood that technology should sort of hold back, try not to do too much harm uh, until we can make this change in the dialogue. But I wanted to ask you, kind of like an off, out there question, is there a role for technology in changing the dialogue? So as an example, you mentioned that 51% of Americans will spend at least a year below the poverty line. I did not know this statistic. And I have to say that one data point alone changed the way I think about poverty probably forever. So can we use the story that the data tells us or new creative technologies, immersive technology, digital connectedness that we have now to change this narrative? And then finally, perhaps in the long arc of history, this moment is not as incredibly unique or important as it seems from where we're sitting right now. But it does feel like the last six months have been transformative in some way. The pandemic, the climate crisis, high profile social justice movements, it seems like social inequities have been laid bare, people are angry and divided. And what worries me in particular is if we see a significant economic downturn, this austerity mindset that there's not enough to go around uh, is likely to feature even more prominently in discussions about social welfare moving forward. So my final comment and my final question to you is, in this intense moment we are experiencing now, uh, is it important for the change you envision? Can it derail us? or can it actually propel us toward necessary change? So I love that you guys are not pulling any punches. These are all amazing questions and great, great points for conversation. Um, I will cover as many of them as I can without eating up all of our conversation time because I do know that we've, I, we've got some questions from the audience as well. Um, so let's talk about a history first, because that's something that I didn't get a chance to talk to in the beginning of uh, my beginning comments. Um, so the, for folks who haven't read the book, um, the first chapter of the book is like a very svelte 26 page 400 year history of poverty policy in the United States. Um, which was originally 90 pages long and then my editor begged me to not make my book totally unmarketable. <laughs> Because um, this history, I think it's so, so important because it underlines all of the continued mistaken ideas we have about poverty in the United States. It authorizes, not knowing that history, authorizes a kind of violent ignorance that allows people to be exploited 
that allows um, uh, that allows us to not see the connection between things like race and class. That allows us to um, disparage poor and working class people for being lazy, criminal, stupid, biologically inferior. That narrative has been at times. Um, so when we don't know that history, um, then we shouldn't be surprised that we then see digital tools that treat poor and working people like they're fraudulent, irresponsible, lazy, sexually promiscuous, dangerous to their families, all of these narratives that we aren't necessarily aware that we have that get built into the assumptions that become what I call in the book, like the deep social programming of these tools. And so that it's like the COBOL of, um, of, of society, right? It's like this deep, deep programming code that's underneath these tools. And so I talk about the tools as really being much more evolution than revolution, um, that they still sit very comfortably with the history of the poor house in the United States, a history where um, it was considered completely acceptable to incarcerate people who ask for help, um, to require that they sign a pauper's oath that says they will not vote run for office or marry because they are asking for help, right? All of that moral diagnosis that was built into our early policies around um, poverty management get, have gotten built in, into these tools as well. Um, and so that's why I think it's so, so, so crucial um, that I think, Sarah, you mentioned sort of the, the language of disruption. And uh, it's so interesting to me. There are certainly industries in which technology has been incredibly disruptive. I have to say public assistance is not one of them, um, right? I mean, the only thing it's disrupted is the ability of frontline caseworkers to do their job and the ability of clients to get the, the benefits that they're entitled to by law or to, to, to follow through on their due process rights, that th those have been disrupted, but the system itself is chugging along quite nicely. Like it's doing what it, it has always done. With, I think, Sarah, you point out some really important differences, um, which is the scale of the system, the opacity of the system, the lack of um, human interaction. And that's the thing I wanna talk about for a second. Um, and uh, as well as the sort of endless, um, uh, the possibility for an endless record, right? An endless interoperable record, right? The ability to then connect the paperwork from Children, Youth and Family Services to the paperwork for our food stamps to, certainly that can work to lower barriers to make sure people get the benefits that they need and have a right to, but it also works to create this like very seamless and frightening web of digital surveillance that really interrupts people's lives and makes them feel much, much more vulnerable to things like um, police intervention or losing their children to foster care. Um, but I wanna talk about just one specific um, thing about what's lost in the new system, which is human discretion. And human discretion, I, I don't talk about human discretion in the book because it's easy. I talk about human discretion in the book because it's hard, right? Human discretion has been part of discriminatory eligibility rules, discriminatory um, enactment of eligibility rules that has blocked people from the benefits they're entitled to by law for decades since the beginning of these programs in the 1930s, specifically women of color. But Pamela, as you pointed out, also folks who are not in um, heterosexual relationships or folks who are single parents or, or folks that a caseworker finds sexually or morally dodgy in some way, um, right? So, but again, this is not new. In the 40s and 50s and 60s, it was really common for caseworkers and police together to raid the homes, uh, uh, late night raids of the homes of, of welfare recipients to check for whether or not there was a man in the house, right? Um, so that kind of scrutiny has always been part of these systems. And it has always been part of these systems in ways that were deployed mostly against racial and ethnic minorities. Um, and so that discretion is super, super dangerous and has been a, a extraordinary problem since the beginning of the system. That said, the system, the institutions in the United States of public assistance are in fact set up for, you, for recipients to fail. And so the only way you can get through the system successfully is to bend the rules a little bit. And now this is a really hard thing for people who have a sense that justice is equal treatment under like that the same rule applies in the same way to, to, to everyone, no matter what. 
And that's why I push people to thinking more about justice and equity than to think about equal treatment and equality is because in many, many cases, treating like cases alike is not the just thing to do. Like you have to treat people in terms of their actual situation. Um, and that was something that really, really came up when I talked to caseworkers is they were really concerned that the sort of younger professionals coming up through the field were learning that their job was to basically be computers, was basically to, to apply the rules exactly in the same way in every single case, was to, um, to shuffle paperwork, um, and to look for fraud, all the things that the algorithms do. But the caseworkers who had been around for a while said, but that's not the job. That's actually not what casework is. Casework is about witnessing. It's about being with people through trauma. Um, and that's the part that is getting lost. And they were deeply concerned about this. And I'll give you one more historical point as to why we should be concerned about that which is the moment that what I call the digital poorhouse arrived, where, where we switched from these offline, in-person modes of surveillance to these digital forms of surveillance. I thought probably happened in the 90s when the welfare reforms, the policy changed. I, and then when I started looking in the New York State archives and it was already there by the 90s, I was like, oh, it must have happened in the 80s when the technology became widely available. But no, it actually happened in, in New York State and um, countrywide in the late 1960s. Um, and that is a really important historical fact to know because what that means is that these tools were designed and implemented at the time of the absolute height of the power of the welfare rights movement. And that gives you a really different uh, picture of what these tools are actually for. Like what political program are they, uh, what political problem are they actually trying to solve? I suspect that these tools are trying to solve the problem of the power of poor and working class people working together, especially caseworkers and clients seeing themselves as being on the same side. And I think that is something that's quite new about these tools um, is that they're very effective at making, at, at splitting um, the relationship between caseworkers and clients. Um, and they're also very effective at making um, folks who are applying for benefits feel like they are the only person in the world do, going through this. What, as a well, I was a welfare rights organizer for about 15 years. And as a welfare rights organizer, as terrible and um, stigmatized and um, you know, criminalized as the welfare office was, like the physical welfare office was, it was also a really good place to organize right? Everybody's sitting in a room together, right? Their kids are there. Everybody's frustrated. Everybody's having the same problems. Really good place to have a conversation. And so I get really concerned as much as I want the pathway to benefits to be as seamless as possible. I get really concerned when we um, electronically corral people on their own, when they're trying to go up against a system that is set up for them to fail. Um, and that seems really overwhelming and really difficult to navigate. Um, we really need each other's help to get through these systems, and that's caseworkers and clients and social movements um, alike. And so that's something I get really, really concerned about. I'm really glad you raised that. I think I will just take one more of the group, and then if you just get really like excited, like you must answer this question, then we can come back to it in the, in the Q&A. Um, Man, and these are all really good questions. So it's hard, it's, um, it's really hard to choose. Um, so let's combine the neutrality question and the why stories question, because they're related to each other. Um, so there's a wonderful political scientist named Deborah Stone, um, who wrote a fantastic book called Policy Paradox, which I think everybody in the world should read, it's brilliant, who's re working on a book right now about numbers. Um, it's about to come out this year. Um, and I was really lucky to read it in um, manuscript form. And uh, the one of the greatest lines I've ever read in my life is Deborah Stone says, numbers are just stories pretending they're not stories. Um, and I really think that this idea that numbers are neutral is just like we have to recognize all of the human choices that go into turning stories into data. Um, and that those are political choices. Like we choose what to highlight 
we choose how to evaluate, we choose how to rank based on our assumptions and the way we think about people and the political context and what our values and hopes are. And right now we're choosing based on this idea that um, there are no universal human rights to economic, to basic, to meeting your basic needs. Um, and that's a choice we can unmake. Um, and so the reason that I shifted from writing mainly as a, an academic writer, as a scholar, to writing as a journalist is that um, I feel, I, I felt maybe 10 years ago, like I had been telling the same story over and over again, and I couldn't figure out how to tell it in a way that it would actually start the kind of conversations that I wanted to hear where um, it could be read by the people who most needed to hear it, which is I think people who are directly impacted by these systems. So it can confirm, not that they need my insight, they're the ones who taught me how these things work, but they need, we all need confirmation that we're not the only ones dealing with these problems in the system. Um, and I, I recognize that the only thing worse um, than um, uh, sort of breaking everything down into very difficult to understand language with lots of numbers in it is then to tell people exactly how they should interpret them, exactly what they mean, and that if they don't agree, they're stupid, right? Like this is not a way to reach people and to prepare them for change. Like the way to reach people and prepare them for change is to, is to touch them in some way, is to, is to help us help them resonate with the experiences of other people, to see themselves in those stories, or to, to see their complicity in those stories. And that's a hard thing to ask people to do. And I do ask the other audience for this book, which are engineers and, and designers and data scientists, to see their complicity in this system as well, which is a hard thing to ask people to do. And I'm not going to shake fingers at anyone and be like, you need to understand that this is the only correct way to like think about this. What I wanted to do writing as a journalist was to tell stories that were rich enough and deep enough and embedded in human experience enough that people had all the information they needed to make up their own minds. And I certainly have a point of view, right? I never ever would say that I am neutral, right? Or that I'm presenting the story neutrally. I'm not, I have a point of view about this. But I also think over the 100 plus interviews I, I did, the five years I spent reporting this story, that I got really deep, um, uh, deep true stories about what people's interactions with these tools are like on the ground. And that's the thing that I think we're most missing in things like, Sarah, you mentioned the AI ethics conversation that's happening right now. I think folks who are, uh, no offense, ethicists, I know there's like 80 ethicists in the room right now, but um, I think professional ethicists and computer scientists actually are quite aligned in the way they think about problems, which is the pursuit of the beautiful abstract problem, right? It's right. like, how do you break it down to its platonic forms and like figure out like the, the most elegant solution. And I wanted to make the solutions not elegant, like, and I wanted to make the problems not beautiful. They're not beautiful in the lives of the people who are affected by them. So it felt absolutely crucial to start every story from the point of view of someone whose life is currently, not sometime in the future, not in a sci-fi utopia or dystopia, right now, this week in your neighborhood, just had this experience. Um, I think so much of this talk about ethics and technology projects the problems into the future so that we're allowed to escape what's happening right now. Um, and my goal was to tell the stories with enough depth and enough passion that people would be like, oh, shoot. <laughs> like this, this, is, this is real, this is important, and this is happening right now. Um, and I hope I succeeded at that. Absolutely. I mean, I would say that the stories in the book accomplish exactly what you just described. Um, I, I feel I, so incredibly lucky that people, one of the changes of writing as a journalist instead of an academic is that everyone went on record with their stories, meaning they used their real names and the real location and the real details of their lives. And they allowed me to verify the details of their lives, right? Docu go through all their documents and make sure they're telling me the truth and all of that stuff that comes along with, 
um, the focus on factual veracity in journalism. Um, and it was an incredible thing to do when I asked these folks who are incredibly vulnerable, their families really face losing food, losing housing, losing their children, um, losing their basic income by going on the record and talking to me. I think it was incredibly courageous and incredibly generous. Um, and that's why I think, you know, that's why I have extra sort of I feel extra responsibility to make sure that these stories reach a broad audience is because I think they took such incredible risk. Um, and they uh, almost to a person said, you can say anything about my life you want as long as it will help somebody else. Like if it will help someone else and it's true, then carry the story. Um, and I just feel like such an incredible, that's such an incredible gift both to me and, and to, to everyone. Um, and so it's really important for me to, to carry those stories. Yeah, thanks for saying that. That's such a counter actually to what you see happening um, with situations where the people that you spoke with and wrote about in the book are sort of, um, I don't know if this is too strong of a word, I would say coerced into giving over their stories and giving over their information and having it collected in order to get, a, like you said, a, a basic human right, the most minimal, um, you know, set of things that people should be able to get access to. That, that is so different from um, folks sharing their stories with you with that kind of trust and, and you know, the belief and the hope that you'll use them to, to impact change. One thing that became really clear talking to folks who see themselves as targets of these systems is um, just no matter what the system was, uh, no matter where they were, like one of the single most important concerns they had was that these tools dehumanize them. They, they um, flatten their experience and also their futures into this like um, set of data points that is not of their choosing. And they found that very violent, um, like that that was a, 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 a very, have being cut off from their context um, and for example, I think Sarah, you mentioned this as well, the intergenerational nature of these tools. Like, so Angel right. worrying that her daughter Harriet will have a higher score in the Allegheny Family Screening Tool because Angel was investigated for right. um, Children, Youth and Family Services. Right. She was horrified by the thought that her daughter would start out behind because she asked for support from the system, right? She was so, so terrified about that. And I mean, I, I talk to other people who uh, like uh, policymakers and some academics as well, who are like, well, it makes sense. Like if you're in children, youth and family services, that means you're a bad parent. So your kid didn't have a good model as a parent growing up. So they're probably gonna be a bad parent as well. And it's just such a deep misunderstanding of what children <laughs> child protective services does, right? Like it, 75% of kids that are taken out of their homes for maltreatment are taken because they lack base, access to a basic human need, like housing, food, right, medical care, or safety. And that's not the parent's problem. That's our problem. That's a, that a societal choice we've made that says, like, we're okay with kids not having a house. We're okay with kids not having enough food. We're okay with families being broken up because a, a parent can't afford an antibiotic, right? Like again, we can say at any point, not okay, <laughs> that that we 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 with we can withdraw our consent from that system and we can create alternatives. Um, but I don't think that these tech that the, these neutral valued tech systems will get us there because neutrality, as um, Paulo Freire says about educating for. Um, objectivity is educating for the status quo. It's the same thing in designing technology. Designing technology for objectivity is simply designing for the status quo while pretending you're not telling a story, right? Um, and so it feels so crucial for us to answer your earlier question, Sarah, to really think about like, what does it mean to see the tools we're building as storytelling machines, right? As political decision-making machines. And what does that mean about who needs to be in the room, right? That, right. that means you don't have to know what like a random tree is in order to make good values decisions about whether or not we should be predicting which children might be victims of maltreatment in the future in Allegheny County. You know, I can pull a hundred people off the street that would not have picked 
as an outcome variable call re-referral, right? Because they know that vendetta calling happens. And like, if you get called on once for no reason, you're likely to get called on a two dozen times for no reason because somebody's after you and, that, and they're using that as a tool. It's, it's really common in that system and it just still, they no longer use that as an outcome variable after my book came out, they stopped using it. I'm sure there's no relationship. Um, but, uh, yeah, they no longer use it, but the fact that the designers at any point thought that that was an acceptable outcome variable just means that really different people needed to be in that room. Anyone who had ever experienced the child protective system firsthand could have been like, oh, that's a terrible outcome. Like, wait, tell me what an outcome variable is. Oh, that's the terrible one. That's exactly how that conversation would have gone. Um, so we really need to expand um, not just the opportunity for people who are going to be impacted by these tools to be part of those conversations, but we have to change the power dynamic, which means that they can make decisions about um, that we're accountable to about how these systems get get made because it's it's their community, it's their families, it's right. uh, and it's our democracy. And if these tools are political decision making machines, then we all need to be at the table talking about how we want them to work and what, what the key values, good core values need to be of those systems. Right. Yeah. So I don't wanna interrupt this discussion, but I think we should try to bring in some of the questions from the Q&A, which are really great questions. I have to say before we start, as a philosopher and someone who works in ethics, I take great umbrage at your characterization <laughs> of the work of ethicists. And I also can confirm that you are very much right about the work <laughs> of ethicists. So I appreciate these discussions as a corrective to that tendency to abstract away from these very like real material problems. Um, so one question that came up in the Q&A that I think is really useful and would introduce a new dimension to this discussion. Um, someone points to um, the fact that a lot of these tools are developed by private firms mm -hmm. and wondered if you could discuss the relationship between the tech industry um, and the sort of technologization of some of these otherwise like public bureaucratic processes. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And I did something in the book quite intentionally that I wanna point out here, which is the first story I tell, the Indiana story, it is true that was a contract with a, a coalition of private companies. Um, but in LA, it was a public-private partnership that was very thoughtful about being transparent, about being accountable, like and being held in a public agency. So there was some kind of democratic governance around how it worked. And Allegheny County was built like with the help of contractors who were academics, but in-house, right? So I think that sometimes this idea that this is just private companies who like don't have any kind of responsibility to democratic governance and are really just in it for a buck, I think that's too easy an argument, right? And I really wanted to focus this, the um, some of the conversation on the role these tools play as social control. Um, and, and for that, you have to be looking at governance. You have to be looking at government um, and government's role in social control. So um, it is true that um, no, uh, many of these tools are developed by private companies. And there are some really smart people who have done a great, much better job than I did talking about the sort of link to private companies, Sophia Noble one, uh, Shiva Vaityanathan. Um, another talking about social media companies, about search, um, and about the role that um, uh, big tech is now playing in governance. Um, so I'm going to leave that to them. Um, and um, one of the things that was great about, great from the point of view as a, of a reporter, about doing work on the public tools is that luckily more information is available about them, right? So I looked at the RFP and the, um, the contract with IBM, right? I looked at the millions of pages of court filings after Indiana canceled the contract and then IBM sued them for breach of contract and then it stayed in the courts for nine years, right? I had remarkable access to the inside of these tools. I really know how the inside of all of those tools work because they were public. Um, and uh, that is something that my colleagues and movements and other folks who are paying attention to these private models don't have. Um, and that kind of transparency, while I think it's not the only thing, um, like to, Sarah, come back to your, you know, that sort of framework of fairness, uh, accountability, and transparency. Right. Um, 
I don't think those are the only things we need to be looking at, but of course they're important, right? Of course we need to find ways that private companies are accountable to something besides the bottom line when they're building tools that decide whether or not you get Medicaid, right? Like that's really important. Of course it has to be transparent so we know how it works if it's affecting political decision-making or resource allocation, of course we do. That said, the reason that I looked at public assistance is if you're fully transparent and um, the, the, and the government takes up these programs and they are programs that are aimed at people who are seen as deviant people, um, then fully transparently and accountably they will exploit and damage those people. Like if there, if there is no political will to force them to not do it. Um, and so fairness, accountability and transparency is not, are not the only things right. um, that we have to be paying attention to, but of course they are important. And I'm excited to see people doing work around trying to figure out how to sort of crack the nut of these private systems, because I think it's absolutely crucial that we know how PredPol works or, well, actually PredPols again was developed in a public institution, but sort of Palantir, for example, or, um, you know, the, um, the ad algorithms for, for Google or the news feeds, uh, political um, stuff at Facebook, all of that's really important to understand. Um, but I was very intentional in choosing mostly public systems to sort of force this conversation about, to beyond fairness, accountability and transparency. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Thanks from whoever. To so whoever. actually, your, your response sort of segues perfectly into a second question that we should highlight. Um, you were just discussing like different values that we might be interested in, like fairness, accountability, and transparency, but maybe those are not the whole universe of values we might care about. Um, so a second person asked about how you described at the end of your talk that we need to build systems with these values in, like, in front of mind. Um, build systems that reflect these values. And they point out that sometimes our public values shift, like yeah. over time, our values shift. Um, and I would add to it that not only do they shift over time, but that we live in a pluralist society. And so there are disputes about values. Um, and so their question is, how can we build technologies that not only put these values questions first and do justice to them, um, but also are kind of I guess, like robust and resilient for these kinds of changes that happen over time or for these kinds of contestations over values. Yeah. So I'd say that these technologies are like budgets. They're moral documents. So the problem is that we're trying to pretend they're not and escape those really difficult political conversations we need to have about how we balance incommensurate values. It's not just that they're going to change. And it's not just that we disagree, it's that there are interests, right? There are people who benefit in exploiting other people who are parties to producing these tools and living in our society, right? Like, but the good thing is like, democracy hasn't figured that out entirely, but there have been several hundred years of thinking about democratic um, politics that have helped us think through things like the tyranny of the majority and the tyranny of the minority. And right, we, we've had these conversations before. So I sort of liken it to like, let's think of a process that's akin to participatory budgeting, right? Where we say, not only do you, can you consult on this, but you can have the power to, to move the lever through these participatory processes that engage larger communities, uh, the, particularly the communities that are most impacted. Um, and this comes back to Sarah's last question too about the political moment right now, right? So I, uh, maybe I'm a, a um, I, I consider myself a hard one optimist, right? So I did 15 years in welfare rights organizing and I feel like one, there's two lessons there. One, the deck has always been stacked um, and it is incredibly hard work. And two, the people you get to do it with are like, funny and smart and resourceful and gritty and like um, amazing in every possible way. Um, so I think before I did that work, I was a much more cynical person about change. Um, and now I um, have come to optimism about change uh, through the hard road <laughs> of like, you know, sharing pizzas and successes and failures and babysitting and, you know, breaking down on the side of the road with, with people who are willing to really make themselves incredibly vulnerable to change the world to be better for their friends and neighbors and children. 
Um, so right now, a moment of incredible economic downturn, and I don't think we've even started to reckon with what this downturn is going to look like. We're not even talking about it yet. And, you know, there's a lot of really important things going on, but like, I'm here to tell you it's going to be deep. Like it's, it's going to be really, really intense. Um, and these are actually the moments that we see poor people's movements come to power um, is moments where um, the consciousness of, oh, my economic problems or my personal failings shifts to my economic problems are systemic and they're shared with other people. Um, and when that change in consciousness um, is, um, is supported and facilitated by seeing six political successes in the world, like, for example, successes in defunding the police, right? Which two years ago, like, would have seen imp like just off the table impossible, right? So we're having this moment of incredible, inspiring, um, full of integrity, passionate political change, and a moment, I think, of increasing um, extraordinary financial and economic deprivation coming that that's going to be really widespread and i think that is the um, the has historically been the recipe for movements that change the way our society works um and so i think i see so many leaders with so much incredible vision leaders probably the wrong way to put it because one of the things that's amazing about today's movements is they're very explicitly they very explicitly share leadership in, in this incredible way um, that has um, that 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 I find incredibly inspiring. Um, so I really see um, the rise of powerful poor people's movements um, taking place in this moment. This work has always been happening. Um, and it faces all kinds of struggles. Um, among them, I think one of the most important ones is dealing with racism within the way that the conversation about poverty and economic inequality happens in this country, um, right? The, the conversation that um, says that all white people are wealthy and all people of color are poor um, is I think a damaging conversation, both to reality <laughs> and to strategy. Um, right. Um, at the same time, recognizing that people of color in the United States face very specific, long-standing structural um, barriers to reaching economic equity that are different than white people's. Um, and so, I think we have a lot of work to do um, in the future to shift those narratives, to produce those better tools, and to, to change the politics. I'm actually feeling really, really optimistic about that work right now. Um, and so I see it, I see it happening and I, uh, I am resting up to be um, part of the chorus. That is wonderful. That is wonderful to hear. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and there's a question that sort of ties in, I think a number of the things that you were just pointing to. Um, and maybe helps us imagine how we do that work moving forward. Um, so someone in the audience asks about how humanity scholars and social scientists can better collaborate um, with the technical folks who are building these systems. Um, and I would add also bring in activists and policymakers and like how do we assemble the kinds of teams that are gonna do the work you were just describing um, in order to actually like make progress towards some of these goals. Yeah, so I've done some of that work in my own organizing in the past and it's hard, right? It is not um, a minor thing to do. There's an incredible power differential. We have this incredible faith in people who design technical systems, like they're always right all the time. <laughs> like they're somehow just smarter and like, no offense, Sarah, I'm sure you're very, very smart. Um, but this idea that like um, folks who work with numbers are smarter than the rest of us is a really damaging narrative and it's not true. And it keeps folks who um, work with these systems from being in touch and in tune with the other their other intelligences as well. Um, so I think a lot of this is about power like it's not just about translation because what translation tends to mean or consultation tends to mean is oh you must misunderstand how this works so we'll bring you into the room we'll explain why you're wrong if you push back we'll tell you you don't get the, that the system's too complicated for you to understand and then we'll send you away again and that's not how this needs to work like it needs to work in ways where we all recognize that we um, have skin in the game 
that we have expertise, we're experts in our own lives, um, and that we have a right um, to be in those spaces. In um, you know, one of the great sort of social movement quotes, I, I think I learned at Highlander Center in Tennessee is like, liberation sounds best in your own language. Um, and that they mean it and they do some amazing movement translation work, ling linguistic translation work. Um, but I think that can be true in these spaces as well, which is like, how do we develop a shared language that takes the complexities of the technical system seriously, but also takes the other kinds of intelligences that are necessary to build more just, more robust, and honestly, more correct systems um, in the future. Because um, we're not, we're not doing that right now. Um, and I'll, I'll say I do a lot of talks for rooms of designers and computer scientists and often they're quite young and and they're always like, give me a five point plan. Like, I'll do all five things. I swear, give me a checklist. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, no, <laughs> like, I'm not going to do that. The work is so much deeper than that. And they're like, OK, well, where do we start? And I'll say things like, well, if you're working around public benefits, you need to know this 400 year history of how social welfare um, policy has happened. And also you need to know a lot about inequality in the United States. And oh, you should probably study the role of race in producing facially neutral, but um, inequality producing policies. And at that point, their eyes will start to roll back in their heads a little bit. And they'll say like, oh, that sounds so hard. <laughs> and That's I'm like, oh, so to me, random tree, stuff sounds hard. So like, let, if we can meet in the middle, like it, it feels like we can get somewhere much more interesting. Sarah, I'm sorry to meet interrupt. But that's why I love your gut check, right? You're yeah. like, you know, is this, and I can't remember the exact wording, but like, is it increasing the autonomy essentially yeah. for uh, poor people? And would you accept, would, you know, would anyone accept this? Would everyone accept this in their own life if, if we're targeted at them? And I think those questions were so powerful because they seem to cover the space, you know, really well and something everybody, everybody can feel. Yeah. And that's, I think the reason too, to coming back to why the book is reported the way it does. I think it's also the reason to start our explorations of these issues in communities that I talk about in the book as um, low rights communities, right? If you can coerce people into accepting it, um, then that actually, you're gonna get like the truest form of that technology in a place where like, you don't expect any pushback uh, um, because the power differential is so intense that you're just like, yeah, I mean, they're undocumented. So we'll just fingerprint them on the street, like on bikes, um, right? That's the truest, form of digital fingerprinting, right, in government use is police riding around on bikes, like forcing undocumented people to give them their biometrics. Um, and that's why we need to start there is, is not only because it's a moral issue, like it's a moral issue of making sure that people most affected by these tools are part of the story and are hopefully in control of the narrative. Um, but it's also about empirical correctness, right? It's about like getting ahead of the curve so I, coming back to why I wrote this book uh, in a different way, I mean, I got sort of t twigged to this as an issue by a young woman on welfare in 2000, right? And she predicted that all of this stuff was gonna happen like almost to the thing, right? The only thing that she was wrong about, and it was partially a joke, is at the time Bush was really into going to Mars. And she was like, oh, that's where they're gonna put all the public housing. <laughs> only thing that has not yet proved true that she predicted. And so the folks who see the sort of pointy end of the stick are just more likely to have good information about it. And we just have to, that's where we need to start. Um, I think every time it gives us better information and it makes us accountable to something besides the beautiful problem, it makes us accountable to our neighbors, to our friends, to our community members. Um, instead of to the sort of seduction of um, a, a complicated question.
Well, I think that is an excellent note to end on. A nice reminder to have with us as we leave. Um, Virginia, thank you so much for this talk and discussion. It was really fantastic. And I'm sure the many people on this, on this call enjoyed it. Um, Pamela, Sarah, thank you for your responses. Thank you to the audience for your questions. Um, it was really a fantastic, a fantastic event. It was such a pleasure to be here. And I can't believe we only lost 25 people. Bless your hearts. <laughs> <laughs> I can really only do Zoom for 30 minutes. So That's I, pretty good. Maybe they're all just snacking somewhere. Um, but, uh, but I appreciate so much everybody being here tonight. And I hope to um, someday come to State College and see you all in person. And we can go looking for where uh, the Center County Poorhouse was together. Right. We would love to have you here in person. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you, Virginia. Thank Thanks, you, Virginia. Everyone. Have a wonderful Thanks, night. Everybody. Good night, everyone.